Chapter 131 The Ball Game Accident and the Attacking Dementor It was a rainy Saturday, seemingly an omen that the gods were not in favor of Gryffindor. Oliver Wood, the team captain, wore a grave expression as the umbrellas outside threatened to be swept away by the wind. Today was supposed to be the day they played against Slytherin, but the Slytherin team had dodged the match, citing injuries to their players. The injured player in question was Slytherin's new chaser, who had an unfortunate encounter with Buckbeak. Those Slytherins! Wood exclaimed, his words laced with frustration. They're probably hoping to see us lose to Hufflepuff. Harry shared Wood's anger, especially after one of his friends was punished by the head of Slytherin and tasked with cleaning the school hospital's urinals. They peered outside, where the rain fell like bullets, stinging their faces as if they were being pelted with small stones. The wind was fierce, capable of unseating any young wizard from their broom, making flight control a daunting task. Harry donned his bright red team robes and, before entering the dressing room, caught sight of Draco Malfoy looking particularly sour, as if someone owed him a fortune. Malfoy was in the stands, flanked by Goyle and Crabbe, who struggled to hold on to a parasol over him. John, who had mastered the waterproof spell, effortlessly repelled the rain from his body and did the same for Daphne upon her request. You seem to be in a foul mood, John observed, glancing at Malfoy. Damn it, they think I'd lose to Potter, Malfoy spat out, his pride wounded. He had been determined to redeem himself, but the team's captain, Flint, had called off the game due to the injuries. This left Malfoy feeling humiliated. He had been fully prepared to prove his worth, and now his own team doubted his strength. Yet Malfoy was not one to shy away from a challenge. In fact, he was eager to face Harry. When you become captain, you'll have control over these decisions, John remarked calmly. But it's hard to accept, Malfoy admitted, his frustration evident. As the game was about to start, the rain blurred the colors of the teams, but John was unfazed. Since you can't play, let's support our friends, he suggested, nodding towards Cedric Diggory, Hufflepuff's captain and seeker, who seemed undeterred by the storm. Cedric exchanged a respectful nod with Wood. It's going to be a great game, he said, displaying sportsmanship that even pleased his rivals. The whistle blew, and the game commenced. Harry and Cedric took to the skies, their eyes keenly searching for the snitch amidst the chaos of bludgers and rain. Harry struggled with his vision, his glasses quickly becoming obscured by the downpour, making it nearly impossible to spot the tiny, golden snitch. The game was intense, with Harry narrowly avoiding collisions. Suddenly, lightning illuminated the sky, and Madame Hooch called for a timeout. During the break, Harry learned that despite the adverse conditions, Wood's rigorous training had given them a 50-point lead. However, without catching the snitch, the game could drag on indefinitely. Harry's spirits sank as he realized his blurred vision severely handicapped him. With these glasses, I have no hope, he lamented. But in times of need, help often comes from unexpected places. Hermione appeared, tapping Harry's glasses with her wand and casting a spell that made them impervious to water. There, now you won't have to worry about the rain, she said, handing the glasses back to Harry. Wood was overjoyed at this development. His gratitude towards Hermione so immense, he briefly considered an impulsive gesture of affection. However, he restrained himself, mindful of the propriety. With his vision clear despite the relentless rain and howling wind, Harry was once again ready to face the challenges of the game. He steered his broom back into the fray, his determination renewed. Amidst the storm, Harry scanned the skies for the elusive snitch, skillfully dodging a bludger that nearly collided with his pie as head and executed a nimble maneuver beneath Cedric. The weather worsened, with lightning zigzagging through the clouds, signaling the increasing danger from nature itself. Realizing the urgency, Harry pivoted for a better vantage point. A sudden lightning flash momentarily illuminated the stands, revealing a large shaggy black dog perched in the top row of empty seats. Harry's grip slipped, causing him to momentarily lose altitude. After clearing his vision, he noticed the dog had vanished. Harry, behind you! Wood's voice boomed over the din of the storm. Harry spun around to see Cedric closing in on the golden snitch. His heart raced with the realization that if Cedric caught the snitch, they would lose. 
Dismissing the mysterious black dog from his mind, Harry accelerated in pursuit. Quick! Faster! He urged himself, his voice lost in the roar of the storm. A familiar, chilling presence enveloped him. The Dementors, the very creatures that had once caused him to faint on the train, were now descending onto the Quidditch pitch in droves. From the stands, John's expression darkened as he finally discerned the cause of the disturbance. The Ministry of Magic can't keep their creatures in check, so it falls to me, he declared, rising to his feet. Before Daphne could grasp the situation, John had already drawn his wand. Expecto Patronum, he intoned. The professors, sensing the anomaly, turned just in time to witness the Dementor's invasion. Dumbledore's expression soured, but before he could act, a brilliant light pierced the darkness. The Patronus charm? Professor Flitwick squeaked, his excitement palpable. A majestic albatross, formed from the silver light, cleaved through the air, driving the Dementors back in terror. Flitwick couldn't contain his admiration for the powerful Patronus. John, focusing intently, extended his right hand, manipulating the rainwater to converge into a massive sphere. The crowd watched in awe as he merged his wand with the sphere and cast the Patronus charm once more. The albatross dove into the sphere, which then transformed into a gigantic white albatross, its sword consuming any Dementors in its path, leaving none to escape. The effort visibly drained John, his forehead a mix of rain and sweat, as the magical exertion took its toll. The giant albatross eventually reverted to water, having devoured the majority of the Dementors. Professor Flitwick, overwhelmed with excitement, praised the innovative combination of the Patronus and water prison charms, lamenting that if this were a classroom setting, he would award John a hundred points. The spectacle redirected everyone's attention to John, who stood in the stands, having single-handedly averted the crisis with a display of remarkable magical prowess. John gently massaged his chest with his right hand, offering Professor Flitwick a smile that was both modest and confident. That's ridiculous, he said, though his tone belied his awe. The words powerful and elegant simultaneously sprang to his mind, perfectly capturing the essence of the moment. Upon witnessing John's successful repulsion of the Dementor, Professor Flitwick couldn't contain his excitement and let out a jubilant cheer. John, basking in the moment, suddenly remembered something crucial. He glanced upwards only to see a figure plummeting rapidly towards the ground. It was too late for him to intervene. Arresto momentum. The air vibrated with the force of the spell, and Harry's descent halted mere inches from the ground. John's eyes quickly found the source of the timely intervention. Dumbledore, with a mere outstretched hand and no wand in sight, had performed the spell. John was no stranger to the concept of wandless magic, but witnessing it firsthand from someone as powerful as Dumbledore demanded respect. He offered the headmaster a salute, filled with genuine admiration. Dumbledore returned the gesture with a smile, his eyes twinkling with a mixture of surprise and appreciation as they landed on the massive Patronus and the cursed water prison John had conjured. An excellent spell variant, Dumbledore mused, silently acknowledging that even Voldemort, at his peak during John's third year, would have found himself outmatched. However, the immediate concern was Harry, who had fainted from the ordeal. As a result, Hufflepuff was declared the winner of the match, a conclusion that came as no surprise to anyone. Cedric Diggory, upon learning of Harry's condition, was struck by a sense of unfair advantage. Driven by his strong sense of sportsmanship, he suggested a rematch. This gesture deeply impressed everyone in Gryffindor, to the point where Oliver Wood, had he been a girl, might have been moved to confess his admiration for Cedric on the spot. The narrative, filled with moments of tension, bravery, and sportsmanship, painted a vivid picture of the complexities and camaraderie found within the walls of Hogwarts. Chapter 132, Ministry of Magic, Pleading Guilty and Sickness. Harry was rushed to the school infirmary, but the chaos of the day was far from over. Dumbledore descended upon the scene with a level of fury that John had never witnessed before. The sight of the Dementors ensnared within a Patronus-crafted water cell ignited a fire in the White Demon King's eyes. The potential disaster that could have unfolded had the Dementors invaded the Quidditch pitch was unthinkable. I need to speak with Cornelius Fudge immediately, John. Please keep these Dementors contained, Dumbledore instructed with urgency. 
John nodded in agreement, even as a few daring students ventured closer, driven by curiosity. Managing the water prison with his wand, John felt the strain of his task. Professors Flitwick and McGonagall joined him, their expressions a mix of fear and outrage. The audacity of the Ministry of Magic to gamble with the safety of Hogwarts students was unforgivable. We must lodge a formal complaint against them, Professor McGonagall declared, her voice laced with venom. Mr. Wick, your timely intervention and innovative use of the Patronus charm, combined with a water prison, is nothing short of brilliant, Professor Flitwick chimed in, his voice tinged with admiration. As the charm's professor, he was genuinely impressed. John, however, was preoccupied with the practicalities. Where should we relocate this? My magic crystal is depleting rapidly, and once it's exhausted, it's useless. The cost of a magic crystal was not insignificant, and the thought of its consumption pained him. Professor McGonagall suggested the dungeon, not the one belonging to Slytherin, but another within Hogwarts. Together, they managed to suppress and relocate the Dementors, leaving John feeling a mix of relief and exhaustion. He noticed the ring on his right hand had absorbed numerous curses from the Dementors, its black lines growing increasingly distinct. By evening, the Ministry of Magic arrived, led by Minister Cornelius Fudge and Auror Chief of Staff Rufus Scrimger. Fudge, visibly distressed and mopping sweat from his brow, was clearly shaken by the day's events. The potential backlash from the wizarding families of England weighed heavily on him. John was summoned to the headmaster's office, where he encountered Dumbledore's sternest expression yet. Fudge, upon seeing John, eagerly approached him, his demeanor shifting to one of gratitude. John Wick, the hero who thwarted the Dementors, your actions have averted a tragedy and salvaged the Ministry's reputation. We are in your debt, Fudge exclaimed, extending an offer for future collaboration. His glance towards Dumbledore hinted at a deeper motive, perhaps an attempt to curry favor with the headmaster. Rufus Scrimger remained stoic, indifferent to Fudge's overtures. John, observing Dumbledore's disappointed gaze towards Fudge, sensed the complexity of the situation. Fudge's actions, though misguided, stemmed from a place of dedication to the wizarding world, a sentiment Dumbledore seemed to acknowledge, albeit with reservations. John stood before the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, with a perfectly crafted smirk on his face. I'm sorry, Mr. Minister, but Principal Dumbledore is expecting me, he said, withdrawing his hand and turning to leave. Upon reaching Dumbledore, John was met with a look of satisfaction. John, we need you to recount the entire incident, Dumbledore requested. John proceeded to describe the events in detail, from the moment the Dementor invaded the Quidditch pitch to how he managed to subdue it. Throughout his explanation, he remained composed, as if the feat he had accomplished was nothing out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, Fudge's expression grew increasingly sour, but John was unfazed by the minister's discomfort. He calmly suggested, I believe the Dementors might have been unable to resist their nature due to the joyous atmosphere of the Quidditch match. Leaving students in their presence is akin to asking a greedy cat to watch over fish. Dumbledore gave a slight nod of agreement, his gaze fixed on Fudge. John knew he didn't need to be involved in the discussion that followed. Dumbledore's words to Fudge were sharp and critical, leaving the minister visibly embarrassed. As the meeting concluded on an unhappy note, John observed everything keenly, sensing an opportunity. Fudge's incompetence was glaring, especially in the face of Voldemort's resurrection. John decided it was time to see if he could expedite the minister's downfall. Unlike Fudge, Rufus Scrimger had always been decisive, employing Aurors to manage the Dementors. Unfortunately, Fudge viewed this as a power struggle and refused to cooperate. After the incident, John sent out a dozen letters to influential purebloods and other prominent figures. He knew that their collective dissatisfaction would be a thorn in Fudge's side, even if the minister hadn't explicitly erred. The current chaos only made Fudge's position more precarious. The next day, the Dementors were removed from Hogwarts. Over twenty of them appeared less menacing than before, with some even wearing ill-fitting robes. Scrimger, who had taken charge of the situation, assured Professor McGonagall of their punishment, confident in the support promised by Lord Johnny Silverhand. After Fudge's hasty retreat to his office the previous night, 
Scrimger was pleased to hear the sounds of the minister's frustration. It had been a long time since he had felt such satisfaction in dealing with Fudge. Meanwhile, Harry Potter had yet to awaken from his fall during the Quidditch match. That night, John gazed up at the clear, cloudless sky, illuminated by a full moon. It was the perfect time to begin his journey to becoming an animagus. With mandrake leaves in his mouth, John was unable to speak, but he had a workaround. Using his wand, he created red sparks in the air to communicate, planning to explain his temporary muteness as a result of excessive magical exertion. When Harry finally awoke, he was devastated to learn that the Quidditch match had been lost because of him. It wasn't the first time, but this loss was particularly hard on Oliver Wood, who was in his final year and had yet to win the trophy. To make matters worse, Harry's Nimbus 2000 had been destroyed by the Humping Willow, leaving him without his beloved broom. John was in a foul mood. The stream of visitors to see Harry seemed endless, and to add to the chaos, John had brought him a box of cockroach clusters. Hermione eyed John with suspicion. What's gotten into you, John? She asked, her tone laced with concern. John remained silent, offering no explanation. Instead, he gestured towards his throat, and then, with a flick of his wand, a marker appeared in his hand. He scribbled down the reason for his condition on a piece of parchment. It turned out that his current state was a result of an incident where he had saved Harry, causing him to lose his voice temporarily. Upon learning this, Harry's guilt intensified. He realized the depth of John's sacrifice and the pain he must be enduring. The atmosphere in the room shifted as Harry and Hermione processed this revelation. Understanding the gravity of John's actions and the bond of friendship that compelled him to act despite the personal cost. Chapter 133 Lupin Returns and Requests Leave After losing his ability to speak, John received fewer points in class. However, the atmosphere lightened when Professor Lupin returned from his monthly transformation, looking somewhat pale but managing a smile. The students, who adored Lupin, immediately voiced their complaints about Snape's harsh treatment during his absence. Malfoy, on the other hand, showed his displeasure, as he preferred Professor Snape over Lupin. The defense against the dark arts class was far from dull, especially when John demonstrated his proficiency in casting spells silently, a skill typically not mastered until the sixth year, yet John had done so in his third. Lupin, intrigued, noticed the ring on John's finger. It was similar in style to one he recognized, but the color was different, and it was worn on the right hand, not the left as Johnny Silverhand did. Curious, Lupin approached John after class, asking casually when he had started wearing the ring. John, surprised by the question, quickly wrote in the air with his wand, Gift. Lupin considered this explanation, remembering that Halloween had just passed, but he couldn't shake off a nagging feeling of doubt. He knew of John's remarkable feat of repelling Dementors with a Patronus charm, a spell dark wizards were incapable of casting. This fact alone made Lupin question any potential connection between John and the notorious Johnny Silverhand, a man known for his ruthless ambition and dark magic. Despite his concerns, Lupin hoped John had no ties to Silverhand, especially with Sirius Black's recent escape possibly being linked to him. As a teacher and a bystander, Lupin sincerely wished to keep his students away from such dangerous influences. In Potions class, John once again caught Snape's resentful glare, prompting him to silently criticize Snape's unprofessional demeanor. Snape, feeling wronged, reminded himself of his reasons for being upset with John, who had lost his voice defending others from Dementors, a noble act that reminded Snape painfully of Lily. John, with his keen observational skills, likely knew of Lupin's werewolf condition, which could have been used to expel him from Hogwarts and implicate him in Sirius Black's escape. However, Snape's plans were thwarted, leaving him to stew in his resentment. Daphne grew increasingly worried about John, especially when his usual hearty appetite diminished significantly. To avoid swallowing mandrake leaves, John resorted to drinking the paste directly. The Star Club, including Cedric and Percy, showed their support, offering remedies and expressing their gratitude for John's bravery in protecting the school. This chapter highlights the complexities of relationships and suspicions within Hogwarts, showcasing the students' and teachers' varied reactions to the challenges they face. 
concern etched in his eyes, John reassured Neville with a wave of his hand, indicating he was fine, despite Neville's insistence that he visit the hospital wing. No, thank you for your concern, John declined, opting instead for Neville's care, which resulted in Neville doubling his training efforts. Alongside Malfoy, Heinrich took on the role of John's rigorous instructor. As time passed, John remained silent, his anticipation growing for the upcoming full moon. However, he noticed Professor Lupin's keen eyes might be close to uncovering his secret. To avoid any confrontation, John requested leave from school activities. Contrary to what many believed, John hadn't left Hogwarts. Instead, he secluded himself in a secret room, only emerging occasionally to check the weather, maintaining a different schedule from the rest of the school. This led to rare encounters with others, who assumed they were mistaken about seeing him. John's preparations for the second full moon were meticulous, especially since clear skies were crucial for his plan. He placed a saliva-soaked leaf into a transparent bottle under the moonlight, adding his own hair, dew, and a hawkmoth chrysalis to the mixture. He then concealed the bottle in the Forbidden Forest, specifically where a spider's nest had been eradicated by fiendfire, leaving it deserted. Following the ritual precisely, John awaited a storm and performed a daily spell at sunrise and sunset, pointing his wand to his heart and reciting, Amato, Animo, Animato, Animagus. His return to classes was met with cheers from Slytherin House, which, to his surprise, still led in points thanks to the efforts of Daphne, Malfoy, and Heinrich. Their achievements kept Slytherin in the lead, much to the dismay of the other houses. As December approached, and with Christmas on the horizon, John's focus was on the impending storm necessary for his ritual. Meanwhile, he pondered whether Mrs. Wick would visit the school during the holidays. The trio of younger students hoped for his swift recovery, while Ron Weasley could barely mask his disappointment. Unbeknownst to John, Ron had hoped Gryffindor would surpass Slytherin in his absence, a plan now dashed with John's return. During class one day, John received a letter from a long-eared black owl, which was affectionately greeted by his own snowy owl, Tom. The letter, from Tang Mi, detailed Cornelius Fudge's attempts to sway public opinion in his favor by vilifying John, now known as Johnny Silverhand, the ruler of Nocturnally. The Daily Prophet painted Silverhand as a tyrant, attributing every crime in Nocturnally to him, regardless of the truth. With a sneer, John contemplated his response to Fudge's actions. Sanctions? Heh, he mused, recognizing that dealing with Fudge required a decisive and authoritarian approach. John began drafting responses, employing a mix of incentives, power negotiations, and coercion. His singular goal was to exert pressure on the Ministry of Magic, demonstrating the true extent of his influence and power. The Minister for Magic was not only foolish, but also remarkably incompetent and selfish. Sometimes certain ruthless methods are unavoidable, John mused, his expression one of mischief as he sent off the last letter. As he rubbed the gemstone on his ring, an air of danger emanated from him. It was as if a predator had awakened, bearing its blood-stained teeth, poised to strike. Within three days, turmoil erupted within the Ministry of Magic. Chapter 134, Accountability and Resignation at the Ministry of Magic. Cornelius Fudge was in a state of despair. The pressure wasn't just from the ordinary wizarding community. Even the prestigious 28 families had stepped forward to voice their concerns. Lucius Malfoy, with a mix of sneer, coldness, and nonchalance on his face, made his presence known in the bustling Ministry of Magic. His platinum blonde hair perfectly combed, he tapped his cane on the ground with a precise rhythm, drawing the attention of many. The sound echoed, dong dong, causing the Ministry officials to turn their gaze towards him. Lucius's influence had grown. Not only had he been reinstated as a director of Hogwarts, but he also owned the Museum of Dark Arts. Fudge, barely concealing his irritation, fixed his gaze on Lucius. Lucius, what brings you here? He asked, his voice strained. Minister Fudge, I'm here representing the Hogwarts board, Lucius replied, his voice cutting through the noise as he found a seat and sat down gracefully. Fudge had organized this press conference in a desperate attempt to deflect blame. The plan was to have Rita Skeeter, the Daily Prophet's star reporter, stir up controversy about Nocturne Alley and direct all criticism towards Johnny Silverhand. If the story gained enough traction, 
it could potentially overshadow the recent scandal of Dementors invading Hogwarts. Fudge glowered at Lucius, vowing to settle scores with the former Death Eater when the opportunity arose. As more people filled the room, Fudge's expression darkened upon spotting Dharma Alex Belby, a prominent figure who had previously pressured him during the Hagrid incident and a recipient of the Order of Merlin First Class. The atmosphere intensified with the arrival of Gilderoy Lockhart, adorned in extravagant turquoise wizard robes. Lockhart, a best-selling author and six-time winner of the Wizard Weekly Most Charming Smile Award, was an unexpected attendee. His presence was significant, not only because of his Order of Merlin, but also due to his membership in the Anti-Dark Arts Alliance, a powerful group composed of influential figures and ministry officials from various countries. Fudge, harboring a disdainful sneer, believed he had Lockhart's measure, considering him a fraud. He was confident that he could expose Lockhart and use him as a scapegoat if necessary. After sending a warning message to Lockhart through his assistant, Fudge mistakenly interpreted Lockhart's distant nod as compliance. As the room filled, Fudge, adjusting his attire, approached the podium. He exchanged a knowing look with Rita Skeeter, who seemed preoccupied with her notes. Ahem, thank you, esteemed colleagues, for joining us today, Fudge began his tone attempting to convey authority and control. Lucius, growing impatient with Fudge's lengthy and irrelevant introduction, raised his hand and interjected with a tone dripping with sarcasm. Minister Fudge, perhaps you could skip the pleasantries and address the matter at hand. The room erupted in muffled laughter at Lucius's remark, leaving Fudge with no choice but to proceed. Giving Rita a nod, he cleared his throat. Please, feel free to ask your questions. Rita stood up, and Fudge, expecting her to target Johnny Silverhand, was taken aback when she veered off script, posing a question that caught everyone by surprise. The mention of Dementors entering Hogwarts on their mission sparked a sharp reaction. Fudge's eyes widened in disbelief as he stared at Rita Skeeter, almost suspecting she was an imposter. Is it a dereliction of duty by the Ministry of Magic that the Dementors are out of control? She pressed. Sirius Black continues to threaten the wizarding world. Do you not bear responsibility? I've heard that ten pure-blood families have lodged formal complaints against you. What are your thoughts on this? Rufus Scrimger, head of the Auror office, once suggested that Aurors should oversee the Dementors. Do you consider it selfish to disagree? Each question struck Fudge like a dagger, leaving him gasping for air, his eyes reddening with stress. He hadn't anticipated Rita Skeeter's betrayal. Was the Daily Prophet turning against him? What was happening? Lucius Malfoy stood, capturing the room's attention with a sneer. On behalf of the Hogwarts Board of Governors, I demand the Ministry of Magic answer for its negligence, he declared, causing a stir among the journalists. Dharma Alex, leaning heavily on his cane, added coldly, The Potion Master's Alliance questions Cornelius Fudge's leadership of the Ministry of Magic. We seek a wise leader, not a bumbling fool. The Alliance, a prestigious group comprising the top potion masters, rarely made public statements, adding weight to his words. Gilderoy Lockhart, seizing the moment, rose with his trademark smile. I, too, question Cornelius Fudge's competence. Under my watch, Dementors would never have invaded the school. His bold claim only fueled Fudge's fury. You liar! Everything about you is a fabrication! Fudge shouted, pointing at Lockhart. Overwhelmed, he ordered his enforcers, seize him and send him to Azkaban. The enforcers acted immediately, launching a sleeping charm at Lockhart. Fudge's grim satisfaction was evident, believing Lockhart's downfall would distract from the day's events. However, Lockhart was prepared. Protego, he declared, casting an iron armor charm to deflect the attack. Then, brandishing his wand, he countered, it seems you wish to attack me, a Merlin third-class medal recipient and honorary member of the Anti-Dark Arts League. Fudge was taken aback, doubting Lockhart's ability to cast such a powerful charm. But Lockhart, fueled by magic from his ring, confidently deflected the Enforcer's spells. He effortlessly dodged their attacks, using silent spells to incapacitate them without uttering a word. Reducto, Lockhart finally declared, sending a blinding white light towards the Enforcers, who were promptly knocked aside. He then turned, a look of melancholy on his face. Why provoke me? Why force my hand? Fudge, now desperate to apprehend Lockhart, 
watched in disbelief as his plan unraveled. Lockhart's unexpected prowess left the minister questioning the true extent of his abilities and the loyalty of those around him. The house collapsed and turned over, a clear testament to the chaos that had ensued. It was evident to anyone with eyes that Gilderoy Lockhart possessed a formidable power, rendering any need for deceit to bolster his reputation unnecessary. Yet, unnoticed by many, Lockhart was so overwhelmed by the situation that his palms were drenched in sweat. Adorned with rings on all but one of his fingers, he was a picture of nervous anticipation. The drama reached its climax, and with the publication of the Daily Prophet the following day, Cornelius Fudge found himself compelled to resign prematurely amidst a whirlwind of scandals and accusations. Rufus Scrimger, the head of the Auror Office, stepped in as the interim minister of magic, vowing to prioritize the safety of Hogwarts students above all. His declaration was bold and uncompromising. We'll stop at nothing to apprehend Sirius Black, even if it means cornering him in a toilet and drowning him in a urinal. This ironclad approach marked a significant departure from the Ministry of Magic's previous, more tepid stance. The Aurors were dispatched to Hogwarts to bolster security and oversee the Dementors. Ron's face flushed with excitement as he recounted Scrimger's words. If you meet him in the toilet, drown him in the urinal. That's the mark of a true, iron-blooded Auror, he exclaimed, mimicking Scrimger's tone. Harry, too, was caught up in the fervor, vigorously stabbing his fork into his potato. They both admired the resolve of the real Aurors, though Harry couldn't help but feel a twinge of sympathy for Fudge, who had shown him kindness at the start of the school year. Over at the Slytherin table, the atmosphere was different. Draco, this is your father's moment, whispered the Slytherins, casting envious glances at Malfoy, who swelled winging the pride. The Daily Prophet featured Lucius Malfoy, looking cheerful and at ease. It was a moment of triumph for the Malfoy family, signaling their grand return to the upper echelons of the wizarding world after a lengthy absence. John glanced at the newspaper. With Fudge's resignation and Scrimger's temporary appointment as Minister of Magic, the focus was now on capturing Sirius. If they succeeded, perhaps the shadow hanging over them could finally be lifted. Chapter 135 The Enigma of Photography Magic and the Marauder's Map. John set aside the newspaper, his gaze drifting towards the Gryffindor table where Ron and Hermione were embroiled in yet another argument. He pondered, how do they manage to quarrel every day yet maintain such a strong bond? The root of their frequent disputes was their pets. Crookshanks, Hermione's cat, had a penchant for chasing after scabbers, Ron's pet rat, which only fueled Ron's disdain for the feline. From Ron's perspective, his loyalty lay with Scabbers, a companion of twelve years, over a cat that Hermione had owned for barely six months. John couldn't help but wonder about Crookshank's peculiar obsession with Scabbers. It was odd, considering Crookshanks should recognize the rat as his owner's friend's pet. A thought struck him. Peter Pettigrew? The Marauder's Map, capable of revealing the identities of everyone within Hogwarts, never listed the rat by Ron's side as Scabbers. John had been aware of this anomaly, but found himself at a loss on how to approach Ron with his suspicions about the rat's true identity. Lately, Scabbers had become increasingly reclusive, hardly ever leaving the dormitory, which thwarted John's plans to investigate whether the rat was an animagus in disguise. With no opportunity to confirm his theory, John reluctantly shelved his curiosity. As he continued his meal, John sensed a presence behind him. Turning, he saw Professor Snape deliberately slowing his pace. Deciding it was time to address the matter, John called out, Professor. Snape halted and turned, an expectant look on his face. John, wiping his mouth, hinted at the heart of their unspoken conversation. Full moon. Snape's response was quiet yet meaningful. Mr. Wick, you are a clever man. John couldn't help but wonder if Snape was subtly mocking him. Dismissing the thought, he replied with a smile, Thank you for the compliment. Their exchange, cryptic to onlookers, resembled a dance of wits between two sly foxes. Snape's quickened departure hinted at his uplifted spirits. The scene shifted to the Gryffindor table, where the atmosphere was lightened by Harry's excitement over Professor Lupin agreeing to teach him the Patronus charm. This new skill promised to shield him from the ridicule of Malfoy and his cronies. 
Speaking of Malfoy, he made a dramatic entrance, circling the tables to taunt Harry about the Dementors, eliciting laughter from his friends. Harry, Ron, and Hermione, momentarily united against a common adversary, stood ready to defend their friend. Shut up, Malfoy. Ron's temper flared, his patience worn thin by the taunt. Malfoy, unfazed, issued a veiled challenge. Weasley, you should be thankful we're in the Great Hall. Ron hesitated, aware of Malfoy's improved prowess. He noted Malfoy's uncharacteristically civil tone, a change he attributed to Percy's influence within the Star Society. I'll fight you, Malfoy, Harry declared, stepping forward in defense of his friend. Hermione, ever the voice of reason, intervened. Enough, Malfoy. Do you want to be locked up? She stood firm, ready to protect her friends from losing points or facing detention. Casting a curse, Ravenclaw triumphed over Gryffindor. Malfoy, with a sneer directed at Harry, mocked, Oh, dear Potter, always hiding behind your friends. He then mimicked a crying baby, turned, and led his group away. Ron, fuming with anger, slammed his fist on the table, while Hermione comforted Harry, He's just a coward at heart. Harry, feeling somewhat reassured, replied softly, I know, thank you. This incident seemed to strengthen the bond between the trio. As time flew by, John dedicated himself to his magical practice, greeting each sunrise and sunset with new spells. Despite the absence of any impending storm, a sense of unease lingered. To hone his skills, he often hunted dementors, leaving one less in their ranks after each encounter. The Auror's efforts had confined the Dementors to a specific area, yet they frequently attempted to escape, not realizing their disappear. Ancests were the work of an unseen predator. John, indifferent to their plight, mastered the art of soul extraction, filling shelves with bottles of soul fragments, each glowing with a white light. The ring on his finger darkened as he became more adept at using the Soul Eater curse to attract Dementors. Almost enough, he murmured, eyeing the collection of soul fragments, now sufficient for his plans with Nagini. Demonstrating his mastery over ancient magic, John crushed a box effortlessly, a spell far more sophisticated than the levitation charm, designed to capture and destroy objects. This technique, discovered in a tome of forbidden magic, left no trace behind. With his preparations complete, John released a boggart that had remained untouched for some time, showing a rare moment of mercy. On December 18th, as students gathered at the castle gates for a trip to Hogsmeade, John noticed Harry standing alone, a picture of solitude. Moved by the sight, John decided to gift Harry one of his marauder's maps, reasoning it rightfully belonged to him. Approaching a puzzled Harry, John revealed the parchment, quickly dispelling any notion of assigning homework with a mysterious hint at the map's true nature. With a tap of his wand and the declaration, I solemnly swear that I am up to no good, the map's secrets were unveiled to Harry, who was astounded by the gesture. This? For me? Harry asked, visibly touched by the gift. Of course, John affirmed, a knowing smile on his face. It belongs to you. Harry's joy was palpable, a testament to the unexpected kindness and the deepening connections within the magical community. Harry discovered several escape routes from Hogwarts, sparking his curiosity. Thank you, John. He expressed his gratitude genuinely. With a wave and the words, mischief managed, John departed from the castle. Shortly after, as Harry was about to use a secret passage to sneak out, he was intercepted by the Weasley twins. With a twinkle in their eyes, they teased, before we embark on our adventure, let's add a bit of flair to the occasion. With that, they ushered Harry into an adjacent classroom. Inside, they revealed to Harry a clandestine method of exiting Hogwarts. Harry, looking perplexed, was about to voice his thoughts when Fred noticed the Marauder's Map in his grasp. Ah, so it's been in your possession all this time. We feared it was lost forever, Fred remarked. Harry, still processing the situation, handed over the Marauder's Map, which the twins promptly activated. Their ease and familiarity with the map struck Harry as both odd and amusing. Thanks to the twins, Harry's path to Hogsmeade was now clear. Brimming with anticipation, he navigated through the secret tunnel hidden within the statue of the one-eyed, humpbacked witch. He followed the winding passage until he emerged in the storeroom of Honeyduke's candy store, his heart racing with the thrill of the covert journey. Chapter 136 Departure from School and the Soul Surgery 
While his classmates made their way to Hogsmeade, John had other plans. Upon reaching Hogsmeade, he promptly apparated to Belby Manor. The sharp sound of his apparition faded as he materialized outside the grand estate. With determined strides he entered, finding Dharma Alex engrossed in potion-making. The sight of John brought a smile to Dharma Alex's face. You've arrived just in time. The Great Serpent is on the brink of awakening, he greeted. Dharma Alex, recently returned from a victorious escapade at the Ministry of Magic, couldn't hide his glee. His successful overthrow of a minister had inflated his ego. Under John's guidance, the potion they were working on had undergone numerous revisions. The addition of mandrake leaves transformed the scarlet liquid into a vibrant green. John then produced a bottle containing a soul, its white light stark against the dimness of the room. Initially dismissive, Dharma Alex's attitude shifted to shock upon recognizing the contents. What have you done? he exclaimed, a mix of incredulity and panic in his voice. John responded with a calm smile. Don't worry, I haven't killed anyone. Dharma Alex was skeptical, but seeing John's serene expression, he relaxed. I'll need an explanation later, but I trust you wouldn't engage in such acts, he conceded after a moment of silence. With that understanding, John added the soul to the potion, which then shifted from black back to white, signaling their success. The potion now glowed a holy white, casting a fluorescent light in the dungeon. The next step was the surgery on the great serpent, Nagini. John approached the slumbering creature, using water elemental magic to guide the potion into Nagini's mouth. Silver threads began to emerge, weaving around the serpent. Success, John murmured, observing the transformation under the potion's influence. Dharma Alex too watched intently, documenting every detail. As the silver and white threads multiplied, Nagini's voice echoed in John's mind. John, she inquired. It's me, replied, his voice a comforting presence amidst the chaos. John then ventured into the heart of the spell, his consciousness traveling through myriad tunnels until he arrived in a misty, white expanse. This realm, a limbo between life and death, was formless and infinite. There, he encountered a woman in a blue dress, her features distinctly East Asian, her beauty marred by a blood-green curse that clung to her. Nagini? John's voice was soft, tentative. The woman looked up, disbelief in her eyes. John, she whispered, her voice a mix of hope and despair. Her appearance was haunting, a once graceful figure now ravaged by the curse, her body a tapestry of wounds and decay. In her hand, she held a small silver-white figure, the essence of the potion that John had introduced. This soul fragment worked tirelessly to mend the fractures threatening to consume her. Approaching Nagini, John observed the blood-green aura that enveloped her, a stark reminder of their intertwined fates. Taking a deep breath, he prepared to confront the dawning task ahead. This situation was dire, but John was determined to restore Nagini to heal the deep wounds that bound her to this cursed existence. John's expression was more solemn than ever as he faced Nagini, the gravity of the situation weighing heavily on him. Nagini, I'm going to start the treatment now, he announced with a determined look. As he raised his hand, his mirrored action was reflected by the external body, allowing for a synchronized and intuitive view of the soul's transformation. If it becomes too much for you, don't hesitate to let me know, he added, his tone serious. Nagini, filled with hope, nodded energetically. A temporary soul protector was in place for Nagini, giving John the confidence to proceed with the treatment without worry. He meticulously opened all the soul bottles from his small bag, and a holy white orb of light began to circulate around him. With precision, John directed his wand through one of the orbs, uttering the spell, Return of the Soul. The orb morphed into a hundred soul scalpels piercing into Nagini's serpentine form. In a blurred vision, Nagini felt the sharp pain as the scalpels penetrated her, her face contorting in agony. John, with unwavering focus, manipulated the soul scalpels to extract the malignant blood curse, drawing it out bit by bit. The curse, in retaliation, transformed into a boa constrictor, launching an attack on the scalpels. Despite the assault, John remained unfazed, his movements steady and precise. As the soul mass depleted, he transformed another soul into a scalpel, continuing the painstaking process. Nagini's soul, fragmented and vulnerable, was meticulously cleansed of the blood curse, hidden even in the most minute crevices. 
Outside, Dharma Alex watched intently as Nagini, enveloped in a silver and white brilliance, underwent a transformation. The sight filled him with a mix of anxiety and awe. Could it really be happening? He thought, barely containing his excitement. It was a sight unprecedented, something not even Merlin could have claimed to achieve. John, with the precision of an orchestra conductor, methodically removed the remnants of the blood curse. Under Dharma Alex's watchful eye, Nagini's form began to shift, her serpentine body gaining human limbs. The transformation was grotesque, a bizarre amalgamation of human and snake, yet John's focus never wavered. The blood curse, stubborn in its resistance, morphed into a giant python, emanating a sinister, blood-green aura. It lunged at John, attempting to swallow him whole. With a flick of his wand, John countered, transforming a soul into a dazzling white light that struck the curse head-on. The soul-crushing curse left the python dazed, allowing John to form a large sword from another soul and deliver a decisive blow to its head. As the blood curse attempted to retreat back to Nagini, John enveloped her in a protective soul barrier, intercepting the curse. Seizing the moment, he struck at the python's root, causing a burst of white light as the creature writhed in agony, unable to flee. Trying to escape, John sneered, summoning another soul orb that ignited into a white flame. The flame morphed into a dragon, fiercely attacking the python. The blood curse, now in the form of a python, was consumed by the soul fire, its wails echoing as it was utterly vanquished. John watched intently until the last vestige of the blood curse vanished. Turning his attention back to Nagini, he noticed the soul protector within her weakening, rapidly diminishing as if deflating. Nagini's fragmented soul looked on in disbelief, hardly able to comprehend that the blood curse that had plagued her was finally gone. Okay, it's all over, John said with a chuckle. Despite the evident fatigue etched on his face, his smile radiated genuine happiness and contentment. Approaching Nagini, John expended the last fragment of his soul to repair Nagini's fragmented spirit. The souls he used were distilled from centuries of dementors consuming the essence of others. Upon connecting with Nagini, these souls began to seamlessly merge with her being. Welcome back, Nagini, John greeted, extending his hand with a courteous gesture. Nagini regarded the boy for a moment before slowly reaching out her own hand in response. Suddenly, an unexpected transformation occurred. The air around them seemed to pulse with a newfound energy, hinting at the profound change taking place. John's gesture, simple yet laden with the weight of his sacrifice, bridged the gap between them, symbolizing a new beginning. However, the tranquility of the moment was shattered as the unexpected transformation unfolded, hinting at the unpredictable nature of magic and the complexities of their intertwined destinies. Chapter 137 Misty Illusions and Hidden Souls John soared through the air, his heart racing as he neared Nagini, but before he could reach her an unseen force struck him, sending him tumbling across the ground. After several rolls, he managed to steady himself and come to a stop. As he looked up, a figure materialized from the blurred surroundings. The sight of the face before him caused John's pupils to constrict in shock. It was a face more handsome with age, its pallor stark against the occasional flash of red in the eyes. The figure wore a plain suit, a cold smile playing on his lips. John knew this face all too well. With gritted teeth, he uttered the name, Voldemort. This version of Voldemort appeared older and more refined than the young student John remembered. Standing up, John faced him, noting that Voldemort hadn't drawn his wand but simply regarded him with an indifferent gaze. So, you've intruded into my domain, Voldemort remarked, his voice laced with disdain. John couldn't help but respond with a mix of anger and coldness. Yours? Voldemort, it seems you've turned Nagini into a horcrux. Indeed, it wasn't just the blood curse entwining Nagini, but also a fragment of Voldemort's soul. John realized he should have anticipated this, given Nagini's role as a horcrux in the original story. Voldemort had not only been ruthless to others, but had shown an extreme form of cruelty to himself by splitting his soul. As John wiped the blood from his mouth, he felt the toll the encounter had taken on his body. The soul, being the essence of a person, meant that any harm to it could have fatal consequences. When Voldemort made a move towards Nagini, an invisible force lifted her by the neck. Asserting his ownership, Voldemort declared, Nagini, you are mine. Nagini? 
she managed to choke out, struggling for air. In that moment, John acted. With a gesture, he sent Voldemort flying, freeing Nagini from the invisible grasp. She fell to the ground as John coldly stated, You're not the only one versed in these magics. Voldemort, slightly taken aback, regained his composure midair and landed gracefully. With a sinister smile and bloodthirsty gaze, he taunted, A weak soul dares to challenge me in this illusion. John's concern deepened as he noticed the silvery light on his fingers fade. The realization hit him hard. Using magic in this realm drained the soul. No wonder, he murmured, understanding the grave situation he was in. Without his magical strength, defeating Voldemort seemed an impossible task. Yet abandoning Nagini was not an option. With Voldemort watching closely, retreat was not in John's plans. Resolved, he decided to confront the challenge head-on. Initiating the attack, John waved his hand, igniting flames in the otherwise empty illusionary space, accelerating the drain on his soul. A fireball grew from a spark in his right hand, surprising Voldemort with the ancient magic John wielded. As Voldemort countered with a water snake, their collision created a dense mist in the misty illusionary territory. Seizing the moment, John dispersed the mist around Voldemort, rendering the soul-generated fog impenetrable to vision. With his right hand, he conjured a dagger made of soul energy, despite the cost of his illusion becoming nearly transparent. With a cruel smile, John reminded himself, Magic? Don't forget, I'm a level 7 master of short weapons. In the mist, John became an omnipresent shadow, moving with the stealth and precision of a nightcrawler. Voldemort, though shrouded in fog and exuding a terrifying aura, was caught off guard. A green light shot through the mist, missing John by inches. Confident in his attack, Voldemort was puzzled by his miss, and a sense of dread quickly filled him. In a desperate move, he turned, but it was too late. In an instant, John had struck, leaving seven bloody wounds as a testament to his swift and deadly approach. Voldemort's expression shifted dramatically as John materialized before him like an apparition. Crucio, he bellowed, unleashing a bolt of red lightning that struck John, eliciting a stifled groan from him as a significant portion of his chest was scorched, leaving a gaping hole. Without a moment's hesitation, John hurled the dagger, then swiftly manipulated it with a spell, sending it hurtling towards Voldemort with lightning speed. In response, Voldemort conjured a defensive barrier akin to the iron armor charm. However, upon contact, the dagger shattered into countless fragments, much like fragile bubbles. Caught off guard, Voldemort watched as John advanced, his eyes morphing into vertical slits. In a gruesome display, John tore off his right hand, which then transformed into a gleaming silver sword. Uttering words in the ancient dragon tongue, he declared, I am a fire dragon. Flames enveloped the blade, and despite the excruciating pain, John thrust it forward, piercing Voldemort's body. The flames erupted, engulfing them in a fiery inferno, and Voldemort's facade crumbled under the intensity. Clutching the blade, his eyes ablaze with fury, Voldemort sneered, You can't escape, Avada. His resilience was evident as he prepared to exchange blows, aiming a deadly curse at John's face. In that critical moment, John's mind went blank, realizing his underestimation of Voldemort. Just as the curse neared, a woman leaped forward, her battered body colliding with Voldemort and diverting the curse away from John. In a fit of rage, Voldemort seized Nagini by the neck and hurled her aside, casting the killing curse directly at her. As the curse approached, Nagini closed her eyes, content with the thought of sacrificing herself for John. Time seemed to slow, allowing John to witness Nagini's resolve and Voldemort's wrath in vivid detail. Releasing the sword, John extended his hand towards Nagini, whispering, Return of the soul. The green light bathed the entire area. Nagini awoke in a dimly lit dungeon, her gaze shifting between the astonished bald old man and John, who lay with his eyes shut, his body gradually turning to gray. Nagini's heart ached as she attempted to approach him, only to pass through his ethereal form. Realizing her own body had been restored and lay nearby, she was overcome with despair. Damo Alex, regaining his composure, questioned, Was it successful? Ignoring his own emotions, he rushed to John's side, revealing that John had used a spectral spell to extract Nagini's soul. Where is John? What happened? Damo Alex demanded, his voice laced with panic. He quickly administered a potion to John, hoping for a miracle. Meanwhile, 
Voldemort, bewildered by Nagini's sudden disappearance, faced John's mocking smile. It seems you're not as knowledgeable as you think, John taunted, his form flickering like a candle in the wind under Voldemort's wrathful assault. Voldemort, enveloped in black smoke, confronted John, lifting him by the throat. The silver sword embedded in his chest disintegrated, but John's eyes gleamed with defiance, a smirk playing on his lips. Curious? Then go ask, he taunted, nodding towards an empty space behind Voldemort. Realizing he'd been deceived, Voldemort spun around, only to find nothing. In a fit of rage, he turned back to John and unleashed the killing curse. This marked the first time John had cast the curse without a wand, striking Voldemort squarely, leaving his visage marred by cracks. With a handsome face twisted in terror, he screamed, not even sparing a glance at John. Clutching his face and howling in madness, it was a tragic scene, especially since he was under the effect of a death curse, an unforgivable curse. Amidst his screams, Voldemort's face began to disintegrate, his body crumbling inch by inch, emitting a green glow from within. The fragment of Voldemort's horcrux perished. John sat on the ground, his gaze drifting in the direction Voldemort had been looking just moments before. He hadn't been lying. In that direction, a figure cloaked in black was barely visible, his face obscured. But John could sense his presence and felt his quiet observation. John's soul felt more transparent, int, as if on the verge of dispersing. Can you make me understand? John spread his hands, his eyes locked on the figure in the black cloak, and asked, are you another soul, or the god of death? The figure remained silent, and John got the impression that the figure in the black cloak was amused. Interesting, you're the most amusing person I've ever encountered, the figure finally spoke as he approached John. John was powerless to do anything but watch as the figure drew nearer. Standing there, the figure in the black cloak radiated an overwhelming aura of deathly stillness. Then, he revealed his identity. You may call me, he paused the Grim Reaper. The revelation hung in the air, heavy with implications. John, sitting on the cold ground, faced the embodiment of death itself, a being shrouded in mystery and fear. Yet, in this moment, there was a strange sense of clarity. The Grim Reaper, a figure often associated with the end, stood before him, not as an enemy, but as a curious observer of the peculiar turn of events that had unfolded. Chapter 138 The Legend of the Three Brothers and the Grim Reaper in the collection of tales by the poet Beetle, there is a story known as The Legend of the Three Brothers. Once, three brothers were traveling along a desolate, winding road at twilight. Eventually, they came upon a river, treacherous and deep, impossible to wade or swim across. However, being skilled in magic, they simply waved their wands and conjured a bridge to cross the river. Midway across, they encountered a hooded figure blocking their path, Death himself. Death was furious, having been cheated of three new victims, as travelers usually perished in the river. Yet, cunning as ever, Death feigned admiration for their magic and offered each brother a prize for their ingenuity in evading him. The eldest brother, a warrior by nature, requested a wand more powerful than any other, one that could win any duel. Death fashioned a wand from an elder tree branch, creating the Elder Wand, the most powerful wand in existence. The second brother, driven by arrogance, sought to further mock death by asking for the power to bring back the dead. Death picked up a stone from the riverbank and presented it to him, claiming it had the power to resurrect the dead. This stone became known as the Resurrection Stone. The youngest brother, wise and humble, did not trust death. He asked for something that would allow him to hide from death himself. Reluctantly, death handed over his own invisibility cloak thus completing the trio of objects that would come to be known as the Deathly Hollows. Tragically, the eldest brother was murdered for his wand, and the second brother took his own life, driven to despair by the hollow return of his lost love. Only the youngest brother, shielded by the invisibility cloak, lived a full life and eventually greeted death as an old friend, departing this world peacefully. As the tale concluded, the narrator revealed himself to be death, leaving John bewildered. So I'm dying? John asked, peering into the shadow beneath Death's hood, searching for clarity. Death, amused by John's demeanor, responded affirmatively. John, facing the prospect of death after narrowly escaping the clutches of the White Demon King, found himself resigned. Saving someone's life and now this, 
I feel rather foolish, he admitted, not ready to accept his fate, but powerless to change it. Surprisingly calm, John's attitude took Death aback. Aren't you afraid? Death inquired. John shrugged, a gesture of indifference. What else can I do? Kill you and run away? His honesty was stark, for there was no point in pretense. Death chuckled, intrigued. You remind me of someone who once faced death with equal frankness. You're not ready to die. In fact, I wouldn't be here if not for you, Death explained, revealing that John had inadvertently solved a problem for him. As a reward, Death decided to send John back to the living. Suddenly, John felt a force pulling him away, and a blinding white light forced his eyes shut. When he opened them again, he was met with the tear-streaked face of Dharma Alex, nearly collapsing onto him in relief. Get off! John pushed Dharma Alex away, disgusted, and quickly checked himself over, as if to ensure he was still intact after his brush with death. Dharma Alex, stunned, could only stare. John, who had been lifeless moments before, was now very much alive, leaving everyone in disbelief at the miraculous turn of events. Just moments ago, John had been on the brink of death, and now, suddenly, he found himself back to life. Overwhelmed with emotion, Alex rushed towards him, unable to contain his excitement. Stop, I know you're excited, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. John, finding the situation somewhat overwhelming, urged Alex to calm down. Heeding the warning, Alex managed to pull himself together, and John took a moment to assess his condition. Am I really back? He wondered aloud. The transition from facing death to returning to the living world left him in disbelief. To confirm his reality, he gave his fac, e a reluctant slap, wincing as his cheek swelled. It seems to be true, he muttered after feeling the sting. Relief washed over him as he realized his return was genuine, though the pain in his body quickly reminded him of his recent ordeal. John noticed the medicine bottle nearby and realized that Alex must have administered numerous potions in an attempt to save him. The thought made him feel bloated and slightly nauseous. His gaze then shifted to Nagini, who lay on the ground, her soulful eyes wide with surprise. I'm back, Nagini, John greeted her warmly, and you're welcome back too. As Nagini's soul was restored, she awoke with a groan, blinking away discomfort. Tears formed in her eyes, and as they streamed down her face, a smile broke through her tears. Thank you, John, she whispered, gratitude evident in her voice. Reflecting on his near-death experience, John felt a surge of emotion. Life is precious, and so is love. Shouldn't we strive for freedom to enjoy both? He pondered. Despite the challenges they faced, he was grateful for the positive outcome. However, Nagini's soul was weakened, leaving her unable to walk. John crafted a wheelchair for her, and she took up residence at Belby Manor. He couldn't help but wonder about the blood curse's peculiar side effect of preserving youth joking that it might have been coveted in the magical world if it didn't involve turning into a snake. After ensuring that Alex would take care of Nagini, John prepared to return to school. He knew Alex would look after her as if she were his own, especially considering the significance of lifting the blood curse, a feat that could earn Alex high honors in the magical community. Upon completing his task, John received a notification of his achievement and a unique ability that allowed him to navigate the realms of life and death. He then apparated back to Hogsmeade, arriving as the sun began to set. Despite having some time to spare, he wasn't in the mood for leisure. At Honeydukes, he purchased a dozen chocolate bars, hoping to alleviate his pallor and the weakness that made his hands tremble. Returning to Hogwarts, John knew it would take some time for his hand to recover, but he was grateful he could still use his wand with his left hand. Exhausted, he sought refuge in his lounge, desperate for a good night's sleep. Waking up past dinner time, John headed to the kitchen where the house elves were ready to assist him. He requested a steak, hoping to regain some strength, but as he ate, he realized something was amiss. After finishing the steak and moving on to an apple pie, the truth dawned on him, he had lost his sense of taste. The realization hit him hard, especially since he hadn't noticed it earlier due to his anxiety. John's mouth was devoid of any flavor, the sensation akin to chewing wax. He had mechanically consumed the apple pie, but the aftertaste left him with a sense of shame. The price he had paid to save a life felt exorbitant. 
It took him a long while, sitting in the common room, to come to terms with his new reality. To deprive a food lover of his sense of taste, the god of death has shown no mercy, John muttered, his fists clenched and eyes burning with a newfound resolve. In that moment of despair, an audacious thought sparked within him. What if he could collect the Deathly Hallows himself and confront the god of death? The idea of challenging such a formidable entity and reclaiming what he had lost filled him with a mix of fear and excitement. Chapter 139, Murder and Talent Hall. John held a piece of bread in one hand, bringing it to his mouth. It was dry, offering nothing but a slightly stiff texture. With Malfoy having gone home and Daphne called back by Mr. Greengrass, the Slytherin common room felt much emptier, almost deserted. Heinrich, spreading jam on another piece of bread, placed it beside John. Aren't you going to ask? he inquired, noticing John's lack of curiosity about his injured hand. In Durmstrang, it's not uncommon for wizards to suffer bodily harm without even realizing it, Heinrich explained, his golden eyes appearing dull beneath his tousled black hair. His pale, handsome face bore a sickly expression. Accustomed to such circumstances, Heinrich began to serve John, taking on a role that seemed more than just friendship. John frowned, asserting, We are friends, Heinrich. Heinrich paused, his dim eyes hidden by his hair. Shaking his head, he responded, To me, you are the beacon of light that Edgar has sought his entire life. His words were sincere, leaving John momentarily silent. He had initially thought Heinrich's allegiance was solely about joining the Star Society, but now it was clear there was more to it. Then I'll trust you to watch my back, John declared, his expression serious. A smile broke through Heinrich's sickly demeanor. Placing his right hand over his heart, he swore, Behind you, there will always be a shadow named Heinrich Edgar. John chuckled. That doesn't mean we can't be friends, right? Heinrich, taken aback, felt a warmth in his heart. There's always a price for dabbling in the forbidden, an eye, an arm, a leg, or even life itself. By comparison, John's loss of taste seemed trivial. At least he still had his handsome face and nose intact, right, Voldemort? With Professor Lupin away for the holiday, John felt a bit more at ease. Lupin's keen perception had always made John wary, sensing that Lupin might have discovered something. After a tasteless breakfast, John made his way to Professor Snape's office. Snape was under the impression that John had uncovered Lupin's secret as a werewolf, and John knew he owed Snape an explanation. Moreover, he was curious about the root of Snape's evident disdain for Lupin. Even without knowing the specifics of their past, the depth of Snape's animosity was palpable, almost as if Lupin had stolen his wife. Arriving at Snape's office, John knocked. The door swung open abruptly, revealing Snape with a sneer upon recognizing John. This left John puzzled. Intelligent individuals often communicate with minimal words. Snape stepped aside, allowing John to enter before slamming the door shut behind him. With a stern face, Snape commanded, Sit. John, sensing Snape's foul mood, complied. Snape retrieved a bag from his desk drawer, laying out various potion-making tools, among which a bottle of Veritaserum stood out. John tensed, attempting to lighten the mood. Professor, surely you don't need that? Snape's sneer deepened. You've kept your lips sealed tight. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been deprived of gossip for so long. Realizing why Snape was upset, John awkwardly scratched his head. Is this about Professor Lupin? He ventured, hoping to diffuse the tension. John had suspected that Snape and Lupin shared a bitter history, but the extent of Snape's resentment seemed far greater than he had imagined. Attempting to change the subject, John reached for the tool bag, only for Snape to slap his hand away. Wincing in pain, John grinned sheepishly. Professor, do you hold a grudge against Professor Lupin? John inquired, quickly adding, Ahem, the students think highly of Professor Lupin. Not bad, that hypocrite, Snape began, his tone laced with disdain, revealing the deep-seated animosity that lay beneath their professional facade. An ugly guy! Snape nearly spat the words through clenched teeth as he recalled that group of infuriating Gryffindors, James Potter, Sirius Black, Peter Pettigrew, and Remus Lupin. The four had formed a tight-knit group, with Snen, Ape frequently finding himself at odds with them. Their encounters often involved casting jinxes, and there was a time when Snape nearly lost his life due to Lupin. Back then, without the Wolfsbane potion, Lupin had no choice but to isolate himself during the full moon, 
enduring the painful transformation into a werewolf. However, Sirius Black once deliberately led Snape into Lupin's hiding place. Although James Potter ultimately saved him, Snape never saw it as a genuine rescue, believing instead that James was merely afraid of the consequences of Snape's potential death. Faced with John's inquiry, Snape's expression was one of indifference as he stared back and posed a chilling question. What if the esteemed professor you speak of was involved in a murder? John was taken aback. Remus Lupin, involved in a murder? The Lupin he remembered, both as Johnny Silverhand and during his time at Hogwarts, seemed far removed from such accusations. Snape's demeanor suggested he was unwilling to delve into the past, leaving John to ponder the implications. He's a dangerous man, John Wick, Snape finally said. After a moment of contemplation, John met Snape's scrutinizing gaze head-on and replied, If that's the case, I know what must be done. But first, I will conduct my own investigation. With that, John stood, maintaining the decorum expected of a headmaster, and left Snape's office. Snape watched him go, his gaze lingering on John's right hand, which hung limply by his side. Something about it seemed to catch Snape's attention, sparking a mix of thoughts and suspicions, but he remained silent. Leaving Snape's office, John found himself deep in thought. Lupin, involved in a murder, he mused, stroking his chin. The contrast between the Lupin he knew and the one Snape described left John conflicted. He regretted not familiarizing himself more with the Harry Potter series before his time travel. Now, eleven years later, his memory was failing him. Complaining about his predicament, John lamented, can't even get a moment's peace during the holidays. Between Azkaban escapees, Animagi, soul magic, dementors, and now a murder accusation, John's year had been anything but quiet. Seeking to heal his injured right hand, John made his way to the Room of Requirement and entered the Gryffindor Chamber of Secrets. There, he prepared a potion using unicorn horn, a rare ingredient. The potion, resembling milk, offered no taste to John, who downed it without hesitation, eager for any relief it could provide. His hand's tremors lessened, but he noted the dwindling supply of unicorn horn, a necessity not just for him, but for Nagini as well. Realizing he needed more, John decided to visit Hagrid, hoping the groundskeeper might have some unicorn horn stashed away. As he approached Hagrid's hut, he noticed a cat and a dog, Tom and Crookshanks, playing nearby. Not surprised by their presence, John was, however, taken aback by the sound of sobbing coming from inside the hut. Recognizing Hagrid's booming cries, John found himself wondering, why is Hagrid crying again? And then with a hint of amusement, wait, why did I say again? Stealing himself for whatever emotional turmoil awaited, John prepared to enter Hagrid's hut, ready to offer whatever support he could to his friend. It seems that Hagrid finds a reason to shed tears every year. In my first year, it was Norbert, the fire-breathing dragon, and in my second, Aragog, the Acromantula. I wonder, who will be the cause this year? Fueled by curiosity, I leaned forward and knocked on the wooden door. The sound of heavy footsteps approached swiftly, and with a creak, the door swung open to reveal Hagrid. He stood there, clutching a pink handkerchief, his face a mess of snot and tears. Despite his rugged exterior, Hagrid had the heart of a gentle giant. John, have you heard? Hagrid's voice broke as he saw me, and he enveloped me in a bear hug that made my ribs creak in protest. Hagrid, please, let me go, I gasped, struggling for air. Three years had passed, three whole years, I low, okayed at Hagrid, with a mix of desperation and resignation. Despite dedicating myself to physical training all year, I still felt utterly fragile in Hagrid's embrace. It made me question, is all my hard work futile when faced with Hagrid's natural strength? Hagrid's tendency to wear his heart on his sleeve, coupled with his immense physical strength, often put me in these awkward, albeit endearing, situations. It was a reminder of the unique bonds formed within the walls of Hogwarts, bonds that were as diverse and complex as the magical world itself. Chapter 140 Angry Harry and Weeping Hagrid In the Gryffindor common room, Harry found himself unable to sleep. The trip to Hogsmeade, which had started on a high note, ended with a revelation that left him reeling. He had learned of the ultimate betrayal, his parents were sold out by none other than Sirius Black, his godfather. This title, both unfamiliar and deeply personal, sent Harry into a state of shock. Sirius Black, his father's best friend and most trusted ally, 
had turned against them, leading to the death of his parents. The mix of emotions was overwhelming. Anger coursed through Harry at the thought of the man responsible for his parents' death. Resentment bubbled up for the trust his father placed in Sirius, only to be betrayed. Fear gripped him at the realization that Sirius had escaped Azkaban, removing the last barrier to Voldemort's return. And beneath it all was a profound sadness at the thought of his parents' trust being shattered by someone they held dear. These emotions churned within Harry like a storm, each thought of Sirius Black fueling his hatred further. He envisioned Sirius laughing in the darkness, mocking him. The memory of how Sirius allegedly killed Peter Pettigrew, another of his father's friends, played in his mind alongside the haunting words claiming success in betraying the Potters. The final moments of his parents' lives, their resistance and pleas, haunted him, ending in the green flash that took them away. Revenge became a singular focus, a concept that seemed both inevitable and justified in Harry's mind. He imagined himself, fueled by vengeance, confronting Sirius. Despite not possessing the same strength as his imagined ally John, Harry felt a courageous heart within him, unafraid of death. As dawn broke, Harry was unsure if he had slept at all. His appearance was haggard, his aura intimidating. Upon leaving his bedroom, he found Ron and Hermione, who were taken aback by his state. Harry, you look terrible, Hermione said, her concern evident. She knew the gravity of discovering one's enemy to be a godfather and the turmoil it must cause. Harry, snapping back to the present, asked about the whereabouts of everyone else. Ron reminded him of the holiday start, suggesting it was time for lunch. As they prepared to leave, Hermione attempted to address the elephant in the room. She knew Harry well enough to recognize the look of vengeance in his eyes. She and Ron implored Harry not to do anything rash, like seeking out Sirius Black. The risk was too great, not just the danger of facing Black, but the consequences of such actions, which could lead to imprisonment in Azkaban. Harry understood the logic, but the thought of letting his parents' betrayer go unpunished was unbearable. His friend's concern was palpable, but the path forward seemed fraught with danger and uncertainty. Outside, the air was cold, and the atmosphere was heavy with a sense of foreboding. The heart of the conversation was being gnawed at by the harsh reality of their situation, much like being bitten by relentless insects with jagged mouths. You know what I see and hear every time a Dementor gets too close? Harry's voice, tinged with anger and a deeper hoarseness than usual, broke the silence. I hear my mother screaming, begging Voldemort for mercy. If you had heard your mother's scream before she was killed, you would never be able to forget it. There's nothing you can do, Hermione interjected, her voice laced with panic. I know, Harry retorted angrily, but you want me to just stand by and do nothing. The conversation abruptly fell silent. Harry watched as Hermione opened her mouth to speak, her eyes darkening with emotion. I'm sorry, Hermione. I, I just can't stop thinking about him. And what exactly do you plan to do when you find him? Ron asked, his voice shaky and nervous. You're not thinking of killing Black, are you? Harry remained silent, prompting Hermione to quickly jump in. Don't be ridiculous. Harry doesn't want to kill anyone, right, Harry? She was desperate for Harry to see reason, but Harry's silence was unyielding. In an attempt to lighten the mood, Ron suggested they visit Hagrid. It's Christmas, after all. He'd probably appreciate some company. Hermione shot him a look that could only be described as incredulous, as if to say, Are you out of your mind? It's too dangerous outside. What if Harry runs into black? Despite the risks, Harry agreed to go without hesitation. Unable to dissuade him, Hermione and Ron resigned themselves to accompany him, both worried yet hopeful that the visit might lift Harry's spirits. As they made their way, the snow began to fall more heavily, quickly blanketing the ground in a thick layer of white. Upon reaching Hagrid's hut, they found John lost in thought, staring at a letter from the Ministry of Magic. Why does it feel like Buckbeak's head is on the chopping block? John mused aloud, recalling a scene from the movie that seemed to mirror their current predicament. Hagrid, overhearing the comment, let out a howl of despair so loud it seemed to shake the very walls of the hut. John, envious of Hagrid's physical strength and booming voice, tried to offer some comfort, albeit awkwardly due to their size difference. 
Their conversation was interrupted by a knock at the door. John, fearing for the safety of the visitors due to Hagrid's distraught state, hastily warned him to be gentle. Thankfully, Hagrid heeded the warning, though his greeting still left Harry, Hermione, and Ron momentarily stunned. As they settled in, Hagrid, overwhelmed by emotion, began to cry uncontrollably. John, attempting to calm his own nerves, nearly caused a disaster with the teacup and table due to the hut's shaky structure. Harry, puzzled by Hagrid's distress, was directed by John to read the letter on the table. We accept Professor Dumbledore's assurance that you were not responsible for this regrettable incident, Harry read aloud, confused. Isn't this good news? John urged him to continue reading. Upon learning of Buckbeak's impending trial by the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures, Harry was baffled. Why is this worth crying over? It's just a trial. Hagrid, barely able to speak through his sobs, managed to say, You don't understand. Those people from the Committee, they only deal with creatures they find amusing. At that moment, the stark reality of the situation was underscored by the sight of Buckbeak noisily chewing on bloody food in the corner of the room a grim contrast to Hagrid's words. John was at a loss for words, realizing that in Hagrid's eyes, any creature that didn't pose a direct threat to him was considered fun. The three friends shared a look of understanding. Hermione, moved by the scene, approached Hagrid to offer some comfort, her earlier frustration forgotten in the face of his genuine distress. Hagrid's distress over Buckbeak's situation deeply affected everyone present, including Harry. Despite their initial expectations for Harry to confront Hagrid about not disclosing the truth regarding Sirius Black, Ron and Hermione observed that Harry couldn't bring himself to do it. Hagrid had always been a father figure to Harry, making it impossible for Harry to express any resentment towards him. The atmosphere was heavy with Hagrid's despair, believing that any defense for Buckbeak would be futile, envisioning the grim fate of his beloved creature. The sadness and fear that enveloped the gentle giant were palpable. John attempted to eat a rock cake, but its hardness and lack of flavor made him grimace in distaste. Seeking to shift the mood, he asked, What did Dumbledore say, Hagrid? Hagrid, momentarily pausing his tears, replied, He's already done so much for me. With everything on his plate, Dementors, Aurors, and Sirius Black, it's just... His voice trailed off into a whimper, the sorrow resurfacing as he lamented, My poor Buckbeak. There might be other ways to handle this, John interjected, hoping to inject a note of optimism into the conversation. All eyes turned towards him, and just as he was, about to offer a reassuring smile, a sudden realization hit him. John had a minor issue with his right hand, which under normal circumstances wouldn't have been a concern. However, the situation was made awkward by the fact that John, known for his alias Johnny Silver, relied on his right hand for writing. This personal challenge added an unexpected layer to the already complex situation, highlighting the vulnerabilities and imperfections that everyone, regardless of their strengths, must navigate. 